And so let me introduce Dr. James Applegate, who is the vice president of the Lumina Foundation. The Lumina Foundation is the largest foundation in the country focused on higher education. And obviously, they do great things all over the country, and they are the leaders, among others, uh, and part of that leadership focused on completion. You'll hear a lot from Dr. Applegate today. He, before going to Lumina, was vice chancellor for academic affairs for the state of Kentucky, so he's been around higher education for a long time, certainly a lot longer than I have. I know that you'll appreciate his viewpoint and the remarks he's about to present, and so if I may introduce Dr. James Applegate. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Thanks to you, to the Ohio Board of Regents, and to all of you for inviting me to be a part of this very important effort in Ohio to fulfill what I call the college completion imperative for Ohio. And I'll talk a little bit today about why that is such an imperative, though I suspect I am preaching the choir. But I know you're here today because you know some very important things. You know that increasing, dramatically increasing the college attainment levels of our workforce in this country is one of the most important challenges that we face. It is one we must meet if our children and our grandchildren are going to have anything like the lives many of us have been privileged to have in this country over the last 50 years. And I know you've come together because you know that to fail to meet this challenge, as I hope I will show you in a moment, not only puts our economy at risk, it puts our democracy at risk. And it certainly undercuts the, the idea of America as a land of opportunity for all. And I hope you're here today because in all the conversations you're going to have today around new ways of doing business, I hope you're here today because you recognize that if Ohio is going to meet its completion imperative, if the United States is going to meet its completion imperative, that we're going to have to do, not continue to do business as usual. And we're going to have to shed a lot of policies and practices that to date, and I'll show you the data in a moment, but let's just be honest, to date has undercut the role of American higher education as a key to social mobility for its people. And that has, in fact, made us vulnerable to the criticism that we do best for those who already have the most, and that we are more about the reproduction of privilege than we are the provision of social opportunity. And that's something that has to change, and I know that's why we're here. So I thank you for inviting me for being here. As the Chancellor indicated, I hope I'm going to do this the right way. All right. Ah, there we go. Oop, back. Uh, as the Chancellor indicated, the Lumina Foundation is the largest foundation in the country that is solely focused on this one issue of college access and success. And we're even more focused, like a laser, on what we call Goal 2025. We adopted this in 2007, and we've been very happy that a lot of people, including the President of the United States, has begun to embrace the, this idea and this goal, first in the world. And it's a very specific goal, and it's grounded in a lot of analysis of what this country needs. And that is to move this country frankly, from where we've been stuck, as the Chancellor indicated, for decades, with about 40% of our population with a high quality, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean there, because these degrees and credentials have to be high quality or they don't fulfill the promise that they're supposed to have, but high quality to 60%, to 60%, that is an audacious goal. In your packet, uh, we do a report every year called A Stronger Nation Through Higher Education. We will release another version here in uh, February of, of 2013. But in your packet, what that does is it breaks out for the nation and then individually for each state and then for each county in each state where, where they are and where they need to go. And in your packet, you have uh, uh, the, the piece for Ohio with the county breakout. You also have in your packet a new, ver a new item that we included in this year's, which is a breakout of the major metropolitan regions in the United States, because we think we've got to begin to mobilize our cities where more and more of our people are living. So uh, you can look at that at your leisure, but it begins to lay it out. I'm going to use some of that data to kind of lay out what I think the challenge is and the road to success for Ohio around college completion. Am I doing this or is somebody else doing this? Ah, there we go. Uh, so first of all, for the nation, this is what it looks like. 
We're at current levels of production with no change. We are growing a bit. We will end up with 46.5% or 79.8 million graduates. We need 103.1 million graduates. That is a gap of 23 million graduates. Now that sounds audacious, but when you begin to break that down by state and by county, you can see that it is in fact doable if we quit doing business as usual. Ah, this is what Ohio must do. As you can see here, uh, if at current rates, Ohio will be at 44%. And I'll show you later that in fact, the projections are 58% of your new and replacement jobs between now and 2018, forget 2025, will require some form of post-secondary education. So this is, there's an urgency to this. If you're going to fill the jobs that are going to be in Ohio between now and 2018, we have to ramp it up. And so for Ohio, that is a, about 900,000 more degrees between now and 2025. So let me just give you a sense, or a real quick sense of how you might, we might get there. I know those numbers can be somewhat daunting. Okay, so this is just one scenario. You could come up with a lot of scenarios. This is a national scenario of how we get there. If we were to up the graduation rates of our high schools, the high schools were mentioned by the chancellor, from an average of around 69% to 75%, which isn't even as good as the best states are doing now, but is, is an improvement. And if we were to increase the college going rate from 62% to 70%, which again, is not equal to the best states, there are states already doing this, but if we could get there, that would add about 3,630, uh, we've done the numbers here, okay? 3,631,000 graduates to the number. If we were to improve college completion rates, above where they are now, but below still the best performing states, you can see the number there. I won't add all these up for you, but you can see it for yourself. If we begin to work with all those students, of which there are millions who are either out of high school already and need a new pathway to college through GED and others, and or those students in high school that are off track, that's a huge population, it's a tough population, so let's just estimate we get a, a small percentage of them back on track to pathways, that's another million. And then, if you think about returning adults, I'm gonna highlight this in just a moment, we have 22% of the current workforce in the United States, and I'll show you Ohio's numbers in just a moment, or 36 to 38 million adults were in the workforce right now with some college and no degree. They actually went to college and left with nothing, as the chancellor was indicating. And I can tell you, not having that credential, as the chancellor said, has a huge negative economic impact. We can talk about the value of learning for its own sake and all that, but look at the numbers in terms of impact on wages and employment, you need the credential. So let's assume we could just get 20% of those folks back nationally. That's a huge number. And then there are a lot of certificates out there that we need to identify, one-year certificates, sub-associate, sub-baccalaureate that are valuable. There are a lot that aren't, but there are many that we can document have dramatic impacts on wage and we can do that. So, so it's just one scenario and by the time you add all that up in terms of doing well, but not even doing as well as the best states are already doing, we get to 24 million. So this is a doable deal. And when I go to, when I was just in Cleveland with the mayor and with the Cleveland Foundation, looking at Cleveland's numbers and they looking at their numbers, they believe they can do this. You just have to start dropping, stop dropping out huge numbers of students of color out of your high schools and get them to college. There are things, you need partnerships between higher ed and K-12, which you've talked about here. So it is doable. So and again, I think I'm talking to the choir here, but why is this so important? Okay, you, this chance to reference the international comparisons. Uh, and international comparisons are important because we are a global economy. Uh, you know, Governor, Governor Kasich in Ohio, no, you're not competing with Indiana and Michigan anymore for jobs and businesses. You're competing with Singapore and Ireland and other countries. So this is the United States. We actually, in the most recent, crept up a little bit to 13th in terms. This is our young workforce. This is the future. This is not, our old folk like me are pretty educated. My, 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 uh, my generation is one of the most educated ever, but this is our future and we're, and we're, we're following. We thought it was terrible when we were eighth. Now we're, we went to 15th, now we're 13th among developed countries. Now let's look at the, here are the states compared to this uh, along these numbers. Where's Ohio? Ah, there it is, okay. So Ohio's slugging it out with Spain, Estonia, and Denmark, okay, right now, in terms of its education levels. 
that's, I know that's where you want to be. But frankly, as I travel around the country, you know, get, get, saying something like, let's beat Norway. And it just, people don't just rise up and say, yeah, man, let's go do that. You know, it does. So let's look at our own economy for a moment, as important as the international comparisons are. This is stuff you know. People with higher levels of education have lower unemployment rates and higher salaries. You've seen all this. But let me show you something you may not have seen. And this comes from a recent report by Tony Carnevale at the Georgetown Center for Education and the Workforce. And uh, I just recommend you go on their site and read every report they've ever done about the economy, and you'll be a lot smarter for it. I certainly am. But this is what ha has happened since the Great Recession. That blue line that's dropping off the map are the number of jobs that are good jobs that are available to people with a high school diploma. Decent jobs that are available to a high school diploma. We lost over 5 million of those jobs during the recession. This trend of, of, of post-secondary credentials being necessary for a decent job was in place for, the, for a long time. The recession accelerated that trend. If you look for bachelor's degree holders, we actually never went down that much, even during the depths of the recession, and we now have uh, gained 2 million jobs in the recovery for, the, for those folks. We're better off, there are more jobs available for bachelor's degree holders today than there were before the recession began, and for associate degree holders, the job market has fully recovered. The bottom line here is, folks, that a high school credential by itself while a necessary step on the road to a college credential and college completion, by itself, in this economy, as it is unfolding since the recession, is simply, simply a ticket to being working poor. That's the best you can hope for. And this difference in the, the, the shortage that we currently have, I just spoke with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on a conference the whole day with Walmart and GE and everybody, it was around the skills gap the skills gap. And because we are not producing enough people, educated people with high quality college credentials, the income premium for a college degree, well you can see what's happening to it here. It, in, the, in the 80s it was 40%, in 2010 it slept to 74% and it's only going to get higher. And ladies and gentlemen, any labor market economist will tell you when anybody is paying this kind of premium for, excuse my language here, a product, you have a shortage. And it is not good for the economy, and it is not the most productive way to run an economy. The other reality of this is we've had a lot of discussion in this country about the income gap and income inequality. Income inequality in this country at record levels is largely the result of post-secondary college opportunity inequality. And that's what we have to fix. So what do we need to do? This is So I hope you... I don't know, there we go. Well, no, that's. So why must Ohio achieve this goal? And I mentioned this earlier. Uh, if you look at the projections to just to 2018, you see that 58% of Ohio's jobs are going to require a high quality post-secondary credential. Right now you're at about, as you know, if you looked at the higher, Stronger Nation report, you're at about 38%. That's 2018, folks. That's not that far away. And so we, it's, it's time to, you know, as Shakespeare would say, screw our courage to the sticking place and get moving here in Ohio and across the country as well. So the, the, the labor market is just, it's, if you want to hold on to the employers and the jobs that you have, much less attract new and better jobs, you, we really have to up the ante in Ohio in terms of college completion. So what must we do? See, and you're gonna, we're going to spend most of the day today talking about some of the things that need to get done in every state, and particularly in Ohio, to get this done. So what must we do? Well, first of all, and this is certainly reflected in your plan, this will require a combination of enormous increases in access to post-secondary education and enormous increases in the success of students who go. It's going to take both. The college completion agenda, sometimes you hear this and it's not true, the college completion agenda is not, at least in our mind, at all counter to the college access agenda. In fact, it takes both working at full bore, more students coming to college and more students completing in large numbers. To, to, to succeed, Ohio and the country must focus on what we call 21st century students. 70 17.6 million students, or 75% of the current higher education student population, as you can see, are juggling family and work. And yet I find over and over again in states, 
in Washington certainly, our policies and practices seem to still be geared to a 1970s version. Our financial aid system is a 1970s financial aid system that doesn't help the 21st century student. These are our students. Now, the Lumina Foundation is primary, that's why the Lumina Foundation is primarily concerned with access and opportunity for low income, first generation students of color and adults. Because those are the folks we're not serving now. Here's the adult uh, information for all of the country. As you can see there, the numbers I just cited, 22% of adults, adults with some college and no degree. Uh, and then you can see the large numbers with only high school. Uh, we have to open the doors for college opportunity for these folks. This is Ohio's numbers. Uh, the, all these in the Stronger Nation report. Again, I'd highlight the adults with some college and no degree that are also highlighted in your college completion recommendations. And let me tell you something, a lot of times when we talk about these students, uh, adults with some college and no degree, I often hear people use the phrase low hanging fruit. Well folks, we're funding 19 different efforts around the country to get these folks back to college. And if they're low hanging fruit, let me tell you, the stems of those fruit are really strong because it is not easy. These folks have jobs, they have families. It takes a higher education system that is focused on their needs and in many ways college has to come to them not them come to college. And they need the same kinds of, they need supports to help succeed. Remember, they've already failed once. And our analysis suggests that most of the time the failure had nothing to do with academic failure. It had to do with life happening. But there's still that difficulty. Let me give you one short anecdote. I was speaking in a state that was, was, that was having a, a major event around these adult learners. And after I spoke, a man came up to me and he said, Dr. Applegate, I'm a veteran. And I've got to tell you that when I came back and pulled and decided to re-enroll in college, when I drove down to the parking lot of the community college and I got out of my car and I started walking across the parking lot to enroll, honestly, I was more afraid than at any time during my two tours in Iraq. So we have to understand that getting, we have to provide the supports. This is going to be hard work, but it's necessary work and we have to focus on the adult learner. We have to focus on equity. These are, the, these are the completion numbers, and if you notice, we do the worst with the fastest growing populations in the country, right? We have to close the achievement gaps. We have systems in this country that are doing that, and they're doing it with a set of well-executed practices. So in many ways, we know how to do this. It's simply a matter of mobilizing to do it. If you look at Ohio, again, you look like much of the rest of the nation. Huge equity gaps in terms of who is getting these degrees. And so, and then when you look at our future, whoop, back one. The groups with the, this is the projected growth in, in, in population. Again, it's the high growth populations that we're doing the worst by. And as a matter of fact, it's not just race and ethnicity, it's also income. This is from the 2010 census, 24 year olds. This, this is perhaps one of the more staggering data pieces, <laughs> for me at least, of the whole presentation. When you look at 24 year olds in the 2010 census, what you see is that among those in the upper income quartile, four out of five have a four year, forget two year, have a four-year college degree. If you were born into the wealthiest families in this country to not get a college degree, you have to jump off the college-going boat, tie a rock around your ankle, and drown yourself. That's the only way you don't get a degree. Whereas among the lowest income, it's one out of 10. So take that, combine it with the, with the equity numbers, and you get this kind of a picture. In 2010, just a few, just to drill a little deeper on this, because I think it's huge and we have to be honest and we have to confront this reality and we have to fix it or we will not succeed. Everyone in this room will fail if these folk fail, continue to fail. In 2010, the bachelor's degree attainment for white Americans, 25 to 29, was twice that 
of similarly aged African Americans, three times that of Latinos. Of the 49 million American students now in K-12, 20 million are African American. By 2050, the Latino population under age 24 is expected to grow by 137 percent to 31 million. Of, the, of those, those, these 49 million K-12 students, 22 million, 45 percent, are from low-income families. If you're talking about P-16 and P-20, these are the students you're talking about helping. In the class of 2010, 67 percent of entering freshmen at the nation's 200 most selective colleges, 67 percent, came from the top income quartile. Only 15 percent came from the bottom half of the income quartile. Also, the share of students at these elite colleges who come from the bottom income quartile is less than 5%. Only 41% of low-income students entering a four-year college graduate within five years, but 66% of high-income students do. That's what I meant about a system who gives the most to those who already have the most. And that's what we have to face. And we have to ask ourselves, these, these gender, uh, these, these um, ethnicity and income inequities have been around for a long, long time. It's not like this happened three or four years ago. And I think we all have to look at ourselves in the mirror and we have to ask ourselves, why are we so comfortable with this? Why have we been so comfortable with this? Because we won't be able to fix it until we become uncomfortable with this. And I think we have to ask ourselves things about race and class and how we approach this. Folks, just frankly, the only way Ohio gets to where it needs to be is through serving low-income students of color and adults. That's the only way you get there. You don't get there through serving the children of most of the people in this room. And so what are we doing to help these students? Well, let me, first of all, we know that the Pell, federal Pell program, which it, a, a while ago sp covered about 70, 80 percent of college costs, now only covers about 30 percent. So you say, well, maybe the states can step up with their, you know, a lot of states have scholarship programs. I recommend to you the Education Trust's recent publication, Opportunity Adrift, that looked at state and institutional aid. State aid is, is moving in the wrong direction. It's state aid programs are going to wealthier and wealthier students under the auspices of merit as if merit is defined by an SAT score. Do you know what the strongest predictor of SAT score is in the United States? Income strong, zip code is stronger. Income, I'll show you that in just a moment. So to say that that's the definition of merit is somewhat distorted. And we have to begin, and it, so, so the state aid programs, I'll give you one example, in Florida, Florida has a program called Bright Futures. They put, before the recession, I don't have the most recent numbers, they were putting between four and five hundred million dollars in that program a year. That's a lot of money for scholarships. It was a merit program, bright futures. Let's add, so we had one of our grantees analyze who received the money. Like whose, bright, whose future is being brightened by the Florida program? And what we found was upwards of 150 to 200 million dollars of that scholarship money was going to families in Florida who make over 200 thousand dollars a year. In Florida, they call it the Car Dealer Relief Program because it allows all those students to have cars when they go to college, right? At the same time that Florida is telling tens of thousands of low-income Latino and other students they don't have enough money to support them to go to college. Folks, that's not only morally wrong, that's, that's bad public policy. That's not the way you develop a workforce that's going to meet the needs of your state. And so we have to have this honest conversation. I had the privilege of being on the Michael and Susan Dell Scholarship Selection Committee for a couple of years. And if you don't know that program, it's a wonderful scholarship program. They target juniors in high school who are ready for college. They may not have the 1,600 SATs or the, 30, uh, yeah, or the 32 ACTs, but they've got 24, 25 SAT, ACTs. They're ready. They have been, frankly, excuse my French, to hell and back to get there. They have been homeless two of the four years they were in high school. They have meth-addicted parents. They have parents in prison. They have gone through all of this, and yet they come to the junior year, and they have, they're scoring well on the SAT, ACT, and they're ready to go to college. And yet the Michael and Susan Dell Scholarship Program can only fund a small, small percentage of these students. Folks, if those folks aren't meritorious, if you don't want them in your college and in your business, these folks have, you want to talk about grit and determination and commitment, they are demonstrating it. And then even here on this, we, in the analysis opportunity of drift, we find even institutional aid is drifting toward wealthier students under the auspices of elitism. 
That is, we want to have a freshman class, first year class, whose SAT scores are three or four points higher than last year, so we can brag about that. So you need to look at where your valuable scholarship dollars are going. Where are your institutional aid dollars going and others? This is the correlation of, this is College Board's own figures. This is the correlation of SAT and income. It's, all, it's very strong. So, un, so again, the bottom line is unless you believe that the ability of an individual to contribute to this economy, to contribute to this democracy, to contribute to the future of the state of Ohio is somehow defined by the wealth of the family into which they are born or the color of their skin, Houston, we've got a problem. Columbus, we have a problem. And we've got to figure out a way to fix that problem, and I know that's what you're about today. There's some other things we've got to do in order to make this work. In addition to solving the equity gaps, the income gaps, focusing on adults, we've got to make sure these degrees and credentials that we're awarding, as I said earlier, are of quality, that they represent the learning that is required of people to succeed in a 21st century economy and democracy. And we have been working on this for quite a while. We've worked with faculty and leaders in higher education for some time. If you look on our site, there's something we call the degree qualifications profile. I'm not going to go into it here. That begins to try to outline what is the learning that a associate baccalaure an associate baccalaureate and master's degree ought to entail to really be a high quality degree. And it embraces learning like this. This is 21st century learning. Computational thinking, novel and adaptive thinking, emotional intelligence, I won't go through all those. This is the kind of learning we've got to make sure is embedded throughout our degree programs, whether they're associate at different levels, but whether they're associate, baccalaureate, or master's degrees. And what we're seeing in analysis of the jobs that are available is that the types of jobs that emphasize physical and mechanical skills are on the decline. The types of jobs that focus on Cognitive skills, the kind we were just talking about, are on the rise. The trends are, are just uniform and always in this direction of the requirement for a more educated workforce. And then also we have to think about, and you're going to talk about this today later in the day, new ways of delivering this education. I mean, you know, my wife was a Montessori teacher for 39 years working with low-income and first for low income students. And there's a, there's a, there's a true, there's a the maxim in Montessori education that says a faculty member, a teacher, should be not a sage on the stage, but a guide on the side. And more and more, with the, in, we have to focus on delivering learning. And let me tell you what a learning based system is not as you think about how to develop one here. It is not focused on seat time. As one of my friends in the faculty told me at one point, if you're focused on seat time for a student, you're focused on the wrong end of the student. So we need, to, we, we need to zero in on the learning that's necessary. It's not organized around semesters. It's not reliant on proxies for learning. We've done surveys where people, and you know this because you probably do it when you go online to buy things from Amazon. If something costs more, it must be better. So there are people who believe you're paying more, you're getting better. It can't be on our small class sizes or all these other proxies that we have. We really have to focus on the learning, and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. A learning-based system is, and this is what a lot in this report that you've talked about, that you're looking at today, it's outcomes-based. It's defined by transparent and accessible outcomes aligned with 21st century needs. It's student-centric. It's open to acceleration. And it's open to innovative new kinds of delivery models. Everybody in the world now has heard about massive online courses. That's one example. Let me give you one example of, 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 of this kind of competency-based approach and how it can make us so much more productive. Uh, Western Governors University, online, not-for-profit university, adult-focused, all its degrees are zeroing in on, on workforce-relevant degrees like in IT, business, medical professions, and teaching. I talked to a woman out west. Western Governors is national. I talked to a woman out west who wanted to be a teacher. She'd been an accountant for a long time. She was about 38, 40 years old. And she went to her traditional institutions. She asked them, how long would it take her to become a math teacher in high school? What do you think they told her? Three, four. The best was three, four. So she went to Western Governors, and she said, well, how long will it take me? And they said, well, we can't tell you how long it's going to take you because it depends on what you already know. We start you where you are. So for every course that they teach, they have clear based outcomes, learning outcomes. And if you want to challenge the course, you take an assessment. If you do well on the assessment, these are all developed by faculty, then you get credit for the course. Friends, she got 28, 26 credits her first semester, and they were all in the math courses. She knew the math better than most high school math teachers did. And then she was able to zero in on what she didn't know, which is how to teach math to a group of hormone-driven adolescents in a high school classroom. 
And in a year in the summer, the tuition at Western Governors is $8,000 a year. It hasn't increased in five years. She was out and students were benefiting. And I know the work you're doing here with prior learning assessment and a lot of the work going on in Ohio is taking you in that direction. So I know I'm running out of time here, so let me just move a little further. Um, so how does Ohio reach goal 2025? It does so by focusing on 21st century students, the students you have, not the ones you imagine you might have had as of 1970, on transparent data and coordinated action, quality learning aligned with 21st century demands. Let me tell you that in, in Virginia, we recently released data and we will be releasing it in more states, and many states are capable of doing this, they just don't do it, where we will be able to show every year what happened to every college graduate in Virginia and these other states by major, by institution. So we will know employment, we will know wages, and we'll be able to track that over time. That kind of alignment and benefits, we have to, even in my most curmudgeonly days as the department chair for a long time, I like to think if I'd gotten a report every year that said my graduates were not getting the kind of jobs I wanted them to have, were not getting the kind of wages I wanted them to have, after criticizing the methodology and the research design, which must come first for any good faculty member, it might have occurred to me to ask the question, it would have occurred to me to ask the question, why is that happening? And what do I need to do with my curriculum, my faculty, uh, my internship programs, my co-ops, et cetera, to ensure better outcomes for my students? So, you know, the public gets this. Our national polling shows us we're at record numbers of parents and people saying, College is necessary for a decent life. Tremendous growth in that number. At the same time that people are saying they're less sure qualified students will be able to get that college than we've ever seen. So there's a great angst in the public. So it's on us. No excuses. To meet this challenge and all the discussions you're going to have today, we're going to have to get a little uncomfortable. We're going to have to think in new ways, new ways of doing business, targeting and resolving problems we haven't been able to resolve in 30 years. No more random acts of excellence. A little cute program over here at this institution, a little cute program over here at this institution. Yes, they work, but they're not going to get us to where this country or to where Ohio needs to be. Let me conclude with a quote. I'm out of communication, so all speech folks have to conclude every speech with a quote. And it's from one of my favorite poets who unfortunately recently passed away, Adrian Rich. And she wrote some decades ago this, the rules, the rules break like a thermometer. Quicksilver spills across the charted system. Whatever we do together is pure invention. The maps they gave us, the maps they gave us were out of date by years. The maps we've been using in higher education up till now has produced the kind of inequities, the kind of inequities across income and class, the kinds of inequities impacting our fastest growing populations. We have to develop new maps, and I know that's what you're about here in Ohio. We must find a way to do this, to create an educational system that provides a pathway to opportunity for those who need it most, that creates an economically successful, globally competitive America, that creates a more vibrant democracy where there is a middle class and there is hope for improvement and opportunity and social mobility. In short, the renewal of this country and it's the renewal of its commitment to opportunity for all is dependent on the success of the kinds of things you're doing in Ohio to change the outcomes, redraw the maps for American higher education. I commend you for taking on this task and any way that the Lumina Foundation can be of help and support in your, in your journey here, we stand ready. Thank you very much.